everyone that ran in the class that I was running, which was one step under Unlimited called TrackMod, was like, you can't touch those cars. And it's like, why? Uh, they're like, you know, those Hondas, the Mitsubishis, the, the Subarus, they're just, they're untouchable. He's like, they're, it's not going to happen. And so I took that as a, a challenge. And I was like, well, I, I feel like a Corvette could give them a run for their money. And sure enough, here we are. <laughs> Welcome to the HPA Tuned In Podcast. I'm Andre, your host, and in this episode, we're joined by Ferris. And if you've been following Time Attack in the US, then Ferris is probably a name you're going to be familiar with because pretty much wherever he goes, he is setting new lap records. In this episode, we dive into his background, how he got interested in cars, and more importantly, how he developed the skills of race driving because let's be honest, these are not skills that come naturally to the majority of us. And driving a car on the road under normal Road conditions is very, very different to getting the absolute maximum out of your car when you're driving around a racetrack. We also dive into his build, and while this car has set lap records at a number of tracks around the US, and don't make any mistake, there is a fairly sizable budget that has been poured into this build. It is not, by any stretch of the imagination, a no expense spared build, and Ferris has been in charge of most aspects of that build himself, barring as you'll learn the engine build and the wiring harness. Irrespective of whereabouts you're competing, if you want to be competitive in time attack, aero and power are really the two key elements. And the aero package is an interesting element with Ferris's build because while he has had Ferris Engineering develop the package, he's actually then gone and built this himself. We find out how exactly that relationship worked and what the aero has done to transform the car. Let's not give it all away though because you'll learn all of that and more as we get into our episode. But before we do so, for those who are fresh to the Tuned In podcast, High Performance Academy is an online training school. We specialize in teaching people how to build performance engines, tune performance engines, build wiring harnesses. We also cover race driver education, race car setup, fabrication, 3D modeling, and CAD, just to name a few of our topics. You can find a full list of our courses at HPAC academy.com forward slash courses and as a podcast listener you can use the coupon code podcast 75 that'll get you 75 dollars off the purchase of your very first hpa course worth noting all of our courses are delivered via high definition video modules that you can watch from anywhere in the world provided you've got an internet connection meaning that you can learn from the comfort of your own place and you can learn at your own pace we'll put a link in the description with that coupon code as well as a link to our courses enough of that introduction let's get into our interview now all right, welcome Ferris to the podcast and as usual let's uh, learn a little bit about your background specifically how you developed an interest in cars and obviously driving fast. Yeah so kind of a bit of the background for me is I kind of grew up around racing. My father he raced Dodge Vipers and so since I think I was like five or six years old I started accompanying him to the track and I would just kind of like try to help out i'm sure i just got in the way a lot <laughs> but i was always in there just you know around cars watching them race he had an auto body collision shop as well and a tow company and so every day as i like grew up i was just always around cars and then as i started to drive i started to build a honda civic actually and it was the slowest thing really ever but i thought it was fast at the time and yeah just kind of evolved from there did some go-karting and eventually as I grew up, I started building off-road chassis for Buckshot Racing out of California. And so I was like their, their lead fabricator. So I was, you know, building chassis off of a jig. I was welding, bending tubes, uh, making skid plates, control arms, stuff like that. And then that just kind of like always kind of sparked of like one day I want to build something of my own. And it never really got there. I did. I ventured off. I did like snowboarding and I taught snowboarding for four years in Lake Tahoe. And I always would come back and build more chassis in, you know, in the off season. And then I moved to Texas, I think when I was like 21 and knew that I, I was like, at some point I need to start saving money so I can start building a car. 
And that's exactly what happened. I, I started to save and I, I kind of eyed out a long time ago. I had a, a 70 or it was a 67 Mustang that I had built with my father and uh, ended up selling that or trading it for a 72 Nova. And I, I started doing pro touring with the 72 Nova. And my father was like, you got the wrong end of the deal. Like you should have kept the Mustang, blah, blah, blah. But the Mustang had kind of over time slightly like diminished as I was in Tahoe and back and forth. It was just always kept outside. So actually, you know, just kind of like anything you just rebuild. And so I got this, this Nova and I built it into a pro touring car and I kind of campaigned it around in, in autocross and uh, I was actually really fast in autocross. <laughs> like it was, it did really well. Wouldn't have struck me as the ideal platform for autocross. No. Maybe. Well, and the, the crazy thing is everybody thinks an old muscle car is heavy, but the thing weighed 2,700 pounds and it was like super light. I had a junkyard 6.0 in it. So it made like 420 horsepower and just like some really light chassis work done to it. And like I would destroy like Corvettes for instance, on in an autocross. And then funny enough, I end up transforming and transitioning from the Nova to the Corvette. But yeah, that's kind of just how it all started for me. Okay. Uh, well, let's just back up a, a touch there. I mean, it sounds like pretty much from the outset, your future was almost a foregone conclusion when you're spending that much time around race cars and, and body shops. It'd be unusual to go any other direction than the automotive industry. However, which we'll get to in a moment, you're sort of not really in the automotive industry at the moment. What I'm interested in, you mentioned there your fabrication skills and building these off-road chassis. So how did that skill set sort of come about? How did you learn those fabrication skills, which I can only imagine have, have really come into use building your Corvette? Yeah, so when I graduated high school, I started to go to college and it just felt like that wasn't really for me. So I started looking into more of the automotive tech schools. And in Riverside, California, they had an off-road fabrication school specifically just for building chassis and, you know, chassis design, engineering, welding. And so I, I started attending that. And I think I got like six months in and my buddy, uh, one of his father's friends was the owner of this off-road company. Buckshot Racing that was looking for a fabricator. So I just went and applied and I got the job. They did like a weld test and I could weld decently well. And yeah, he's like, okay, well, what's going on at school? What are you learning? Blah, blah, blah. And I just kind of talked to him about it all. And sure enough, he hired me and I started actually like building chassis from day one on my job when I was still like just trying to fit tubes and like weld at a table. <laughs> at the school. It's a big jump forward. Oh, yeah. No, it was crazy. I had, I had they handed me this book of like nothing but like how to's and like, you know, they would have jigs, but they'd also have like a lot of notes. And so you'd, you'd have to just like read and it's like, you know, measure 20 inches, bend to 20 degrees, measure whatever, clock it to this angle, you know? So it was just like- So this is before the time of CNC bending and CNC cutting. So it basically becomes a kit set that you just assemble on a jig. Yeah. I mean, I'm just greatly simplified that, but yeah, it sounds like a lot more labor intensive what you were doing there. Yeah. And it was always, there was a lot of room for error. And so like, as you were learning, as I was learning, right, I wasn't yet a full on fabricator. I was making mistakes, <laughs> like kind of wasting material here and there, but it took a lot. And uh, eventually it just became a really great skill set. And, you know, now I can look at something and it's like, okay, well, I know what I need to do here. I can, and it's just something that has stuck with me since, I mean, I did it for, I think almost six years. Yeah, you're going to pick up some skills over that time. I assume you didn't walk into the shop and, and on day one become their lead fabricator. There was sort of a path of progress to get you to that point. Yeah, no, I think it was year two. So it took about okay. two years to get there. But it's still fast. No, I mean, well, the main thing is they were looking for a fabricator. And so they had like a foreman or someone who ran the shop, but he was he was the fabricator at the time as well. And he was trying to transition into just more of, of you know management and, and not really so much hands-on building. And they put me in the position of a rolling jig where it's just like the chassis gets built off this jig. It wasn't like a flat table. It had all the jig pickup points and everything for like the lower bars. And then as you build it up, there's that, that middle hoop and then like attach more jigs onto it. And then the main hoop comes on and so on and so forth. And so, yeah, pretty much from day one, I was... I wasn't the lead fabricator, but I was just building a full-on chassis. Yeah, wow. Okay, straight in the deep end. Straight into it, yeah. <laughs> I can assume here, yeah, maybe I'm wrong, but I assume that the fabrication of those chassis would have been in chromoly? 
It was all chromoly, yes. So there's a few subtleties there as well when it comes to fabricating a chassis or a roll cage out of chromoly in terms of minimising the, the heat input to the weld so you don't end up with a, a large heat affected zone around that weld and that can cause the chromoly to become brittle and actually fail outside of the weld, is that correct? Yeah, yeah. Chromoly is also known for not really bending, right? Under stress, it will actually break or crack. So I never really like full on TIG weld the car myself because I just didn't have those skills of, of being a great TIG welder. As I progressed, then, you know, I would do sections of TIG welds and then flip the car and do section of TIG welds and flip the car. But at first I was just, you know, learning MIG welding. So yeah, it wasn't really a uh, jump on in and weld the whole thing. It was, you know, I build it, somebody starts to weld it. I keep continue to build, somebody comes back and welds more, you know, something like that. Okay. All right, moving forward a, a little bit, and I just sort of alluded to the fact that you're currently not working at least wholly in the automotive industry, and we talked off off year before that uh, you're working in a, a granite industry. So you know, can you fill us in on, on the jump into that and, and how that sort of came to pan out? Yeah, so that was like the reason for the move to Texas. I was teaching snowboarding for a bit. I was making like $8 an hour, you know, and like living off Top Ramen and Bud Light. Like it was like the worst living ever like in Tahoe, but it was so much fun. I, I lived with uh, people from all over the world. I lived in employee housing and there was like a state line Nevada. So there was like the casinos and everything right there. So it, although I didn't make a lot of money, it was a great time living there. Yeah. So I just, I needed to, to work and the opportunity in the granite industry came up and it was, you know, open up a new location, manage it for a while, open up a new location, manage it for a while. And that's kind of just how I made that transition. Okay. So at the moment you, you're working a lot on building your car or cars which we'll, we'll dive into is there an intention to transition out of this granite industry and sort of embrace your skill set and passion in the auto industry and and if so what's that kind of look like what's the the game plan yeah i mean i would love to i think in order to do that you'd have to really have a, a great clientele and steady income so for me to to jump entirely away from it 100 percent would take i think a lot but it's automotive is where my heart is. Racing is, is where I want to be. I want to be around cars. Recently, I just got like a budget drift car to just kind of like learn how to drift and, and mess around in. And like, I love working on my own stuff. I love working on my own car. But if this drift car wasn't mine, I would, <laughs> I would lose my mind. Like it's, there's so many things about, uh, you know, working on cars that can be frustrating. And if it's a client's car or a customer's car, I feel like it might become more of a headache than a joy. And right now I'm in the joy of the industry of working on my own stuff. Yeah. yeah. What, what would you sort of say some of those frustrations of working on customers' cars? What are you actually referring to there? I've got a few ideas in my own mind, but I'm, I'm keen to hear what you're, you're sort of referring to. Yeah. Well, if we're going to leave, take everything out of it, of the equation and just only what I'm referring to on, on working on a car that is, is mine, the hassle and a lot of hours spent when something should only take X amount of time, but yet it takes Y. And then, you know, I don't know how you would actually justify that to a customer. Like, yeah, the, you know, I build you for five hours, but it actually took 20. You know, like who's you're just losing so much on that. I, I mean, I come from the background of running a performance shop for 13 years and I'm feeling what you're talking about there because that's exactly what happens and there's nothing worse than, you know, sort of facing reality when you're three hours deep on that job that should take 15 minutes and you absolutely know that it's going to be difficult, if not impossible, to, to recoup all of those hours and charge the customer. So. I always looked at the franchise dealership model where you know they've got a book time for the cam belt of four hours and you absolutely know that any tech who's, who's good at their job can smash that out in sort of 45 minutes to an hour. So the franchise dealership model is like printing cash in comparison to the performance workshop one where we kind of go the opposite way, spend four hours and, and charge an hour. But it's not all doom and gloom. Those are fortunately the exceptions. There are a lot of jobs that, that do go through smoothly. In terms of your skill set obviously we understand now you've you've got a, a good capability in fabrication what other sort of automotive skill sets would you say you've got I'm, I'm imagining if you work on your car at this level there's going to be a, a pretty high competency with just general spanner spinning mechanical as well yeah so i pretty much do everything on my own vehicle the only thing i really try to not do is wiring wiring is like my nemesis 
I try to stay away from that. But as far as, you know, mechanic work, I do everything uh, fabrication wise. I do everything um, unless it's like important uh, aluminum welding. I'm not the greatest. Like I can weld up aluminum, but if it's an important, let's just say like a coolant system, I would try to find a, a friend or someone who I know that's good at, at welding aluminum. You know, steel, I'm, I, I have no problem welding any steel. But uh, yeah, all mechanical work I, I do myself. The only thing I won't do is engine building. I know that I can build engines, but I don't know how reliably the engine will be. And so at a, at a high level of, of, you know, any form of racing or just anything in general, you kind of want a professional inside of something that's so critical as like the heart of the vehicle. And so, you know, when you're making a 1, thousand, fifteen hundred horsepower that's something that I think I want someone who's specialized in only that to, to work on for me. So It's interesting. I kind of went down a different path. It's a tough one because obviously the, there are shops out there who do have really, really good reputations and turn out exceptional work when it comes to, you, know, you mentioned wiring there, but also engine building. Finding the right people though can be tricky and kind of I guess where my career kicked off was I was, I was building up my drag car and at the time it was a Mitsubishi Evo 3 that we're aiming for 500 horsepower, so not really a lot by today's standards. And after kind of hearing so many horror stories about people in car clubs and you know the, the car scene that I knew in general that had terrible experiences with local engine builders and performance workshops, I kind of I got scared almost and thought, well... I think if I, it's that old sort of story, if you want something done properly, do it yourself. So I, I kind of jumped in fairly early and, and learned those skills. I totally appreciate what you're saying, but I'd also tempt that with, it is a skill, I think, engine building, if you are interested in learning, that as long as you've got uh, some patience and an eye for detail, it absolutely can be achieved. I'm not saying that's right for everyone, but I, I think a lot of people get scared off that and the the wiring side of things because there's a little bit of an unknown there. I think with the wiring, what I quite often say is I think as soon as it's a situation where you can't, you know, obviously you can't see voltage, you can't see current in this you know, something goes pear-shaped and the smoke gets out, in which case it makes itself real apparent. But that makes it hard for people to get their head around. But again, I think if you understand the principles, it's, it is something that can be achieved. Anyway, a little bit off track there, but I just wanted to, to chuck that into the mix. Well, as far as wiring is concerned, like for me, the biggest thing, like you said, is voltage and understanding that language of it all, right? Following directions, you know, terminate, terminate, wire to wire. That's like not it. It's just like relays, you know, how many voltages does this need? What does what this determine? Like it's stuff like that. And then like once it gets to the PCM, it's like pin connector A36, like making sure it's actually there. Then once it's all done, you're like, great, I, I finished. And then like it doesn't work. And you're like, shit, where do I go? How do I, how do I diagnose this? It, there's a definitely, there's a background level of knowledge that we need to learn about and then yeah there's, there's a process but yeah you're definitely not alone let's come back to the the driving side of things and you mentioned karting and i'd wager that probably just about anyone who's in formula one or, or indycar at the moment probably has likely a background in karting so it's sort of a breeding ground for future champions and that's a pretty well-known sort of story but i'm interested how does that Carding, what you learn in carding, how does that transition to conventional sort of modified passenger cars turn into race cars like what you're racing now? Yeah, I wish I had more of like a, a background in carding. My carding was like all done at K1 style go karting. It was, I never like actually had like a full on background in carding, which I wish I would have because who knows, like, like you said, you, you know, Formula One drivers start in carding and they progress and that's they end up in Formula One. There's this place called Dremel One. And it was like the K1 version before there was K1. And it was uh, uh, gas-powered cars, uh, carts. And that's kind of how I just would go to, to quote-unquote, you know, Dremel 1, K1, and just like mess around for a few hours and go home. And, and that's kind of how I my karting was. I never got to be in a professional cart or anything like that. Karting skills are amazing. Like at any time now that I can, I will get in a cart. And I have a 8-year-old son that I've had him in cart since he was 2. And he, yeah, he's incredible behind the wheel. He's very shy and timid around other people. But if he's by himself, the guy is absolutely amazing. And we were at the track like a month ago and he was out there with a couple of the guys who run leagues. Their father was like, is that your son? And I was like, yeah, he's like, he is really good. And I was like, oh, thanks. Yeah, he 
like doesn't like to come out here and be around other kids. He's like, well, both my kids run leagues and your kid's putting seconds on them or, around the lap. So I was like, okay, well, what I taught him was actually is working. You know, it's, he's out there and he's running faster times than what kids are doing in, in leagues. And it was noticeably different. It's like the way he was getting through turns and, and lapping them. It was, it was crazy to see that this kid's just there maybe like the fifth time, you know, and, and these kids have been running that the leagues on it. So uh, that was pretty cool. But as far as the skill set in karting itself, I don't know in just a, a passenger car how well it transitions, but it transitions to me really well because everything's happening very quickly in a cart. And in a very high level time attack car, everything's happening very quickly. And so as far as like vehicle control, spotting and, and uh, uh, hand movements, stuff like that to me are transition really, really well over to a time attack car. Brakes and, and cart feel a little bit different, but I mean, you're feeling grip, you're feeling, you know, what's the limit. Sometimes you pitch the cart and in your driving style, you could pitch the car. My car likes to not really have too much angle and not really throw it in the corners. It wants to be stuck and it wants to power out. Where in a go-kart, you purposely sometimes will pitch the car so that you have a great exit. So I guess it just depends on, on what you're racing for me and how that transitions over. I mean, I had some background on karting many, many years ago, but got out of it before I got too sort of serious. But I mean, yeah, one of the elements that's quite different I guess to most conventional cars is the fact that the back axle is solid there's there's no differential effect in there so you've also got no suspension of course on a cart so there's a, a bit of a difference in terms of setup and then driving style to actually overcome what essentially happens with a, a locked axle is it promotes corner entry understeer so there's a bit of getting around that correct? Yeah I mean I would say for sure because the way that my car would corner compared to the to the cart itself is quite different. So I don't think I would uh, be practicing or, or transitioning whatever I did in a go kart. Let's just say around the same track or, or the same turns as uh, I would do in my car. I'm interested also just to talk briefly about this drift car that you mentioned you've bought. Obviously, you, you're not trying to drive the time attack car sideways, or at least not very much. But I'm interested. You know, do you see there's going to be sort of a cross pollination, I guess, of skill sets between drifting and grip racing? Um, I think 100% because in a time attack aspect or any kind of grip racing, you're not trying to lose grip. And anytime you're in a high G corner or you start to lose the rear end, it's kind of like this panic feeling and you're instantly trying to correct. Sometimes you overcorrect and in drifting, you're purposely getting the car sideways or losing grip in the rear and, and putting it in positions that you want it in where in grip racing, you if let's just say it accidentally came out or it came out of nowhere and surprised you, you're in that recovery mode. And so I think being comfortable behind the wheel is key in what in anything that you're driving. And if you're uncomfortable being sideways, if you're uncomfortable losing grip, then that just puts you in a horrible position behind the wheel. And if you learn that drifting mindset of being out of control, quote unquote, losing the rear end, that will just make you a better driver overall. And you'd be more comfortable in those situations when you actually are put in, in that. So you're essentially trying to make your driving a little bit more instinctual when the car does get a little bit out of shape. So it's not a panic to recover it. It's just you're doing it and basically without having to think about it. Yeah. I mean, and like also I think recently, like I, I haven't really, I've been doing this for like two weeks. So I don't really have <laughs> the great yeah. the greatest knowledge in it, but I'm already seeing like how this could benefit me and approaching corners where if the car's tight or if I already know that I'm having a problem with corner entry, I can pitch the car and do things with it that I'm currently not doing. So I just think it's a great skill set to have in the belt or under the belt. I think if you were to take a rally car driver and put him in a grip car, he would do absolutely amazing. But if you put a grip driver in a rally car, they might not do so well. Uh, and so I, I kind of look at it like that, where it's just something that would just make you a better driver overall. And it's a lot of fun. I mean, uh, to be honest, I kind of always was kind of anti-drift because anytime I'm on track after drift, the track is horrible. And so I've always been like, God, he's got these damn drifters. <laughs> but uh, I'm always going after a record. Anytime I go to a track, I don't go to podium. I don't go to, to win. I literally just, I look at the track record or what the record is. And that's my goal. Yeah, wow. It's a very different approach. 
it is. I'm not there to podium. Uh, like, of course, I want to, to win, but I'm not. My goal isn't there to get first place. My goal is to get the track record. And if you get the track record, first place in the podium is going to come with it. Chances are, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, but that's my goal. My goal is to get the record. And if I don't, if I go somewhere and I just win and I don't get the record, then I'm like, man, that's this is just not what I wanted. And so I'm I'm down. I, I didn't achieve my goal. And so when you're drifting, when you go out after drift. That's almost impossible to do. Just marbles all over the track. Oh, well, you can see it in the data. The data literally will show, you know, let's just say you were cornering with like 2.5 Gs before or breaking with 2.5 Gs, and you can physically see the data drop and it, you lose, you're losing it. And it's not because, you know, you're driving any differently. It's because of the track is going away. You know, just for, for instance, this last record that I got was at Gingerman Raceway, and I've chased this record for three years. Will I Young used to hold it uh, in his uh, Honda Civic. And he's held that record, I think, for four or five years. And every time I would go, I had the wrong mindset. I wouldn't show up on Thursday. I would only go Friday, Saturday. And I would be, you know, practicing on old tires and not really taking it in consideration that the track is constantly evolving into a worse track because it's a festival event so they're always drifting on it and, it, and we're going on after drifting and so i would i failed for three years in a row although i won the event i could not get the record so what you're saying is essentially your best shot at it is the first session of the weekend first session of the weekend before drift is there and that's what i did this year i went there first session out i i did it was the first two sessions drift didn't end up uh, running on thursday I knew I had two sessions to make this happen. And so, yeah, I went out Thursday for session one on uh, the same tires I was on from Road Atlanta, and they were fairly good. And then I went around for session two. I put on some stickers, and they were like, we're not even timing this session. I was like, well, you you have to time this session because this is the only chance I have to set a record. And uh, sure enough, I went out for a slap out, set the record. That's also, it's almost the polar opposite, though, of a, a conventional road race event where there is no drifting, where the evolution of the track kind of goes the other way. You know, you get to the start of a race weekend, maybe the track hasn't been used for a week or maybe a month, it's dusty, you've got no rubber laid down, and then you know, over the course of the weekend, if the conditions are right, the track rubbers up and actually becomes more grippy and you've got more cornering g-force available braking g-force etc so very different to what you're explaining yeah oh yeah now the evolution of the track is to a complete polar opposite so it's like instead of a, a track that is constantly evolving and getting better it's constantly getting worse and the craziest thing is you see it in the data and you know like you know data doesn't lie so if you're if you're chasing time you can find it in the data you can see where it's at you can see where you're losing time to yourself if a track is evolving you can see it in the data if track is diminishing it's in the data yeah frustrating but you can't argue with the data uh, let, let's just get into the the way a time attack event works um, i'm figuring that probably most of our listeners have a broad idea but maybe if you can give us the sort of 30 second uh, sort of rundown on on how these events work yeah so traditionally time attack is you go out there and you try to run a lap or two in U.S. time attacks, I feel like it's slightly different than in Australia or in Japan. People tend to treat it more like an HPD session or, or time trial. But the way I like to kind of treat it is kind of like a Formula One race in a way or, or qualifying. I go out and I just try to do a, a slight warm up of my tires and I go as fast as I can and, and try to get a great lap, lap one. If it doesn't happen, I'll try to cool the car or I'll go for a second consistent lap. And at that point, you're probably not going to do any better because these cars are so high strung. Everything's starting to get too hot. Uh, your engine is starting to, to approach its limit of what it can do. <laughs> and, you know, I try to tell people as much as I can, like lap three, lap four, all you're doing is killing more tires. You're doing more wear and tear and damage to your car. Tires have a, a peak life in time attack style because you're after the, the softest compound that you can run. And once those tires get too hot, well, it's not really going to happen anymore for you. Like you might end up setting a good lap, but it wouldn't have been your optimum lap. So it's definitely different than what I'd say like traditional racing is. It's more of just, you know, go out there, set a lap, cool the car down, come back in. Yeah. So you've essentially got one or, or maybe two flying laps. And after that, the tires are cooked. Everything's on the, on the way out. So it requires you coming off the track or at least cooling everything down substantially before you can go again. 
Uh, just talking about the tyres a little bit, what, what are the regulations and the events you run in the US in terms of what tyres you're able to run? Are these a dot tyre, a full slick? Yeah, what's the story there? So for unlimited classes, what I run, you can run a full slick. So any racing slick tyre that you'd want, as long as it's a non-confidential compound, it's available to the public for unlimited class. Everything else is going to be 60 treadwear, 200 treadwear. Uh, I don't think there's anything over 200 treadwear, maybe for like enthusiast class or something like that, but it's all has to be relatively available to the public as well. I've been on non-DOT slicks for the past two years now, and it is amazing the difference in grip levels that you have in a non-DOT slick versus a DOT slick, or even just like a DOT slick to a 200 treadwear tire. In the US, those are very, very similar, but you can do so much more on the non-DOT slick. It's pretty crazy. Yeah. Okay, I mean, one of the issues that I hear, we, we sort of head over to World Time Attack, which you're going to be attending in a little over a month now, I think it is. So they have changed the tyre rules for this year at World Time Attack, and I think that's probably a good thing, all, all things considered. But basically, the complaint that I always heard over there, they were forced to run a Yokohama control tyre. This is a, a dot-treaded uh, road tyre, essentially, albeit a very, very soft and, and sticky one. But I mean, the, the top guys basically would sort of creep out of the pits, casually go around their, their outlap, trying not to put any heat or stress into the tyre, and then sort of come onto that last corner onto the front straight, and sort of they're all, all on. And you know, if you were lucky, you got sort of three quarters of the flying lap before the tyres would start overheating, and sort of you're on a basically an ice skating rink again so kind of managing that tyre you didn't have a chance like if, if you made a mistake in your one flying lap that was it you didn't get to go again because the tyres were basically cooked so big advantage by the sounds of it though with your slicks that you're running at least being able to do two laps back to back even if they do need to cool down after that. Now in terms of these time attack events you, you're not strictly directly racing door to door with other cars this, I think, in New Zealand with the time attack events that we've seen has been a real advantage in terms of getting more people into the sport with less risk involved. I mean, there's always risk involved with racing, but compared to a, a grid of you know, 15, 20 cars door to door, there's a lot going on, particularly through those first few corners in the first lap. You've got separation between the cars. So would you say it is a good way of people getting into road racing? I would say depends on how you treat it. Because if you're just getting into it, I would say it'd be more of like you need seat time. You'd want to be in your at the time trial setting or like HBDE setting. To me, that's more of a an easier way to get into it. Because like I said, in the U.S., people tend to treat time attack like it's not time attack. And I don't think just because the tire is what's causing in Australia, for instance, a world time attack for the cars to only do one or two laps. It's the performance level of the car. And if you have a, a very high strung performance car out there that's only going to do one or two laps and you have a bunch of cars that can do 20 laps or close sessions down at, you know, half the pace, it makes it very difficult. Yeah, that's a fair point. Yeah. Yeah, it makes it no longer time attack, I feel. It just makes like an open session kind of lapping. But I would recommend time attack to almost anyone that I meet that is interested in, in doing something like that because it is a challenge to yourself. You know, you, you're not after beating this other guy to the finish line you're after your own personal goals and what you know what lap time you can do and, and you're bettering yourself because you're constantly just you're challenging yourself you're trying to beat your own time and so i find it very very challenging because it's not like you're in a heat of a battle side by side door to door around the whole track it's it's a real mind game if you mess up a quarter you see the time disappear and it's, it's like, man, well, now I got to go next session and let's just say it gets too hot. Well, that was your time. That was your window. So sometimes the window is very, very slim and you're not perfect and you don't check all the boxes off. You kind of hate yourself for the rest of the weekend. <laughs> is there any sort of fundamental differences in the setup between, you know, if you took your car, assuming it could do a, a 15 lap grid race? Maybe it's turned down a little bit. But assuming it can, there's no problems with the mechanical strength or overheating, etc. Are there any fundamental setup changes that you would make on the car to do a 15 or a 20 lap race versus just going for this one sort of glory lap? Yeah, so my car can't, I mean, if it, on a good day, if everything works out, it has like ran until it runs out of gas. Like it'll do 15 or so laps, but turn down. The changes that I would make if it was a wheel-to-wheel -wheel race would for sure just for one be aero 
and then a lot of different suspension changes once that arrow comes off the car to make it more compliant. If the car is so high sprung, literally the spring rates are so high that if you were to get rid of that arrow, it would be um, undrivable almost and kind of sliding around. So a more compliant setup for wheel wheel racing and yeah, probably a little bit uh, less power. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <'Cause> <laughs> all that's going to do is just murder everything. Definitely. How about geometry? Would there be anything you do, maybe a, a less aggressive suspension alignment to look after the tire better over a longer race period or it is what it is? I don't think so. Not, at least not with the Corvette. The, my, uh, all my alignments and, and everything is, is very relatively, I think, nice on tires and, and easy on tires. Everyone, I have guys who race wheel to wheel and our alignments are almost identical. And then as far as geometry, the Corvette has great suspension geometry. So literally I'm running stock suspension geometry. I'm running stock control arms. The spindles that I have are just like a one inch lowering spindle. So nothing, I can't really change anything on there. It's just, it's such a great platform. It's hard to, to deviate what's already there. Well, well, let's talk about that platform, sort of natural progression with this chat. When you were deciding on a platform to develop into a race car, now a time attack car that's been obviously incredibly successful, what initially was it always the Corvette that you were were sort of angling towards, or was there a, a list that you kind of went through? So I kind of, in my mind, I had two cars, and the reason why was budget for one, as I didn't know it was going to be this, but I also knew that the Corvette A was a great platform. It had great racing pedigree. I knew that you know something that I wanted to compete in needed to be something that had history in being competitive, and so. For me, everything kind of just was off the list except for the cars that I knew had great success in racing. And where did I look? I, I looked in at, at EMSA cars. I looked at those type of class of vehicles of like, these are the cars that they're out there, they're winning, they're racing. This is the, the platforms that I'm after. And my short list of two cars, because that's what was going to be the most affordable, was a C6 C06 Corvette and a 997 Porsche Turbo. Okay, quite quite dramatically different. Well, the Porsche Turbo that I was looking at was like $50,000-ish, right? And they're higher mileage Porsches like it. But the Corvettes that I was looking at, this was at the time, was like a $36,000 Corvette. Now the C6 platform has held its value, and some of these Corvettes are selling for more than what I bought it for years ago. But it's kind of hilarious. But those are the two platforms I was after. And the reason behind the Porsche was the all-wheel drive. And I think an all-wheel drive platform has tremendous advantage in cornering uh, exit on course. And the rear-wheel drive platform has uh, great success with putting down power, but might struggle on an exit. And so the reason why I ended up going with the Corvette was just strictly budget. There was so much aftermarket support for the Corvette. There's so many parts available. Uh, it makes great power from the start. And when I started to look at parts for the Porsche, I was like, oh, I'm going to run out of money real soon on this thing. Yeah, there's got to be a sort of a Porsche tax involved, I think, on a lot of those parts for sure. Yeah, yeah. I have a lot of friends who are in Porsche racing. And so, you know, growing up, I saw these guys was always at track with the Porsches and the cup cars and the all white. You know, that was like my draw to the Porsche, which was so clean, like the whole white interior, the the white roll cage, it just was like, I want that. But when I looked at budget, I just knew that I wasn't gonna be able to afford that in the long run. And that's how I went with the Z06. And sure enough, I blew the engine in the Z06 for like the first two <laughs> weeks of owning the car. A lot cheaper to rebuild than uh, a Porsche engine. Yeah, and it had the dreaded the valve. I literally was just on the freeway driving. It was like in sixth gear, just in the fast lane. And sure enough, boom, I'm like, are you kidding me? Like it's going 80 miles an hour. Like I wasn't even doing anything special. But I wish it was a more fun story, but as far as like the engine going, but uh, yeah, that was how I ended up leaning towards the Corvette. One thing I have wanted is coming back to that Porsche platform as well. I've, I've sort of thought if you were to develop a fully fledged time attack car, where obviously the aero package is so important, power as well, but you know, the aero is what we've kind of seen develop, particularly at World Time Attack over the eight years or so that I've been covering that event is the location of the engine in that 997, I can only imagine would make it incredibly difficult to develop a, a really effective diffuser at the back of the car because simply you've got an engine where the diffuser needs to be. Is that sort of a fair point? That is, that's a very fair point, yeah. And it's also the same thing for my vehicle. Oh, of course. <laughs> 
transaxle. Yeah, it's very difficult. Oh man, I stare at it every day like, how can I improve this? How can I make room? But there's there's no way. All right, let's jump into the, the C6 specifically. And you know, if you could sort of assess in the base model terms as you got the car, where are its strengths and weaknesses if you want to take that package and turn it into a competitive time attack car or race car in general? Yeah, I think the strengths in the Corvette are, are literally that it was built to be a sports car and it was built to make a lot of power from the factory. I think a lot of these cars we see that are, have problems with braking transmissions, braking driveline, stuff like that. They're cars that were never meant to make power. You know, I, I hate to pick on, let's just say a Honda, for instance, but a Honda will have a lot more problems making a thousand horsepower, not because it can't, but everything in the Honda itself is just so much smaller. It's a very compact car. It wasn't meant to handle those power levels. And so in a Corvette, when you literally compare side by side, like the transmissions are massive. The axles are massive. All the mounting locations are massive. Like it, it's just, it's meant to handle a, from the factory, you know, 500 horsepower. So we're doubling it, but the components themselves are ready from factory. We're meant to, to take abuse. Then you have Corvette racing that has, has gone around for years and has amazing pedigree. And that transitions down to the Corvette over the years. They're developing and changing things based off of what they're doing in racing. And so I think for one, the fundamentals of just a strong vehicle to begin with, that's a good draw point towards the Corvette. You know, the C5 and C6 Corvette have amazing suspension geometry. And a lot of people know this. A lot of people were like, oh, well, it's an American car can only go straight. These American cars dominated in all of its racing in the Le Mans for years. I mean, that the C5 and C6, I think, is like the most uh, winning platform in all of its history. It's pretty incredible what these cars can do and what have done over the years. I, th- I think that's probably a pretty common misconception that the Corvette is just a straight line car and going around corners is, isn't going to be its strength. But as you mentioned there, the suspension setup on the Corvette is, is actually just about perfect for, for racing, isn't it? It's great. And that's why you see a lot of these aftermarket companies who are building you know, aftermarket suspension for, let's just say, an older vehicle. They're all using Corvette suspension in those vehicles, the knuckles, the bindles. They're all based off Corvette geometry. A lot of the pickup points, upper and lower control arms, that's all Corvette stuff. And so, like, I don't want to mention a name, but X company has their, you know, Camaro bolt-on subframe. Well, those bolt-on pickup points are really the same kind of geometry as the Corvette, and the spindle looks just like a Corvette. It's because it's kind of a Corvette. Okay, so the other element here, we, we mentioned the transaxle, and for those who maybe haven't heard that term too much, instead of conventionally having the gearbox attached directly to the back of the engine, the, the gearbox and the differential are one, and those that's located at the rear of the car, and you've got a prop shaft running the length of the car that spins at, at engine speed, essentially. So that's relocated the gearbox back. So I'm guessing there's got to be a benefit here in terms of weight distribution in the car. Yeah, they're very well balanced because of that reason. I mean, the, they're still lighter in the rear, but it helps get the balance there and it gets it to being like a 50-50%. My car currently is slightly heavier in the front still. I do have a little bit of added weight with the reinforcement of the splitter, which that I'm redesigning all that to cut that weight. But yes, factory-wise, they have great as far as a weight distribution front and rear. And the transaxle setup in the car is very strong. I'm, I might me personally, I'm running the factory case, I'm running the factory diff, and I've you know, put down 1,300 horsepower, 1,300 foot-pounds of torque, like nothing in that thing. And I'm of all these years, the factory diff that I'm still running that came with my Corvette from 2008 is in the car. And the only thing I've ever had to change was one stub shaft and one clutch pack. That's a, that's a pretty impressive reliability for something that has been driven that hard and making that much more power. Uh, to be clear, not a standard gear set in that transaxle, though, correct? You now are a, a dog engagement, sequential gear shift. In the actual transmission itself, yeah. The case itself is still factory. Okay. So when you purchased the car and sort of started developing it, I'm assuming that taking down every racetrack lap record probably wasn't uh, on your mind right then so what was the design criteria initially and how's that kind of developed over the time you've been racing the car yeah so initially i just wanted a car that would be fast on on a road course and that i could drive around and daily drive it i had i've always had a second vehicle i had like a truck of some sort to like uh, trailer to events but i wanted to have a car that i could like drive on the street to work if i wanted and 
it transitioned out of that very quickly. I think since once the engine let go, it went from being that idea of, okay, well, it's just going to be, you know, a car that I can track and daily to how fast can we make this car? What's the <laughs> biggest, what's the biggest engine I can put in this car? And so it went south real quick. It did stay in a, a more street form for longer than I expected. I started doing Optima Ultimate Street Car with it. And to run that series, it needs to be a street-esque car. You need to have full interior. You need to have uh, a radio that works. And so I didn't really have big arrow in the car. I actually had no arrow with the car, just factory stuff for a while. And you know the transition from that to where it is now was after the, I think year two or three of running Optima, one of my buddies started running in an organization called Grid Life, and it was they were doing Time Attack. And he was like, dude, you got to come out to Grid Life. It's more than what we're doing in Optima. And so I was like, well, I, you know, all these events are spread out across the U.S. Like that's like all the whole Midwest. Those are, you know, 16, 25 hour drives for me. And uh, I was like, well, and all you guys have the advantage. You've been doing this for a year now. You know those tracks. I don't know these tracks. And so it was a mixed kind of thing of like, I'm going to go and get beat. Because A, I don't know the track and my car is not developed for it. And so I did it anyway. And so I ended up year one of, of building my car outside of, let's just say, a streetcar spec was for the closest event to me that was going to be a Time Attack event. And it actually was a super lap battle at Circuit of the Americas with Global Time Attack. It was in 2019 and it was the first time that they, had, uh, they were going to be hosting it at Circuit of the Americas. So I was like, perfect. This will be a great way to get my feet wet in Time Attack. So I started researching Time Attack builds. At that time, Time Attack was unknown. I didn't know anything about Time Attack. I just knew that I was doing time trials. And so I started looking into Time Attack and I saw all the big arrow. I saw the horsepower. I was like, perfect. This is like right up my alley. I didn't know anything about arrow at the time. And I still don't know very much about arrow. It is a wizardry art, but I mean. I think it's one of those areas where there's sort of a, a bit of a crossover between art and science. Obviously, those who understand it know it well and, and do a great job. I don't profess to have very much knowledge in the aero department at all. But um, we have had the likes of uh, Andrew Brilliant and... Um, Verus Engineering as well have joined us for the podcast and as well, so maybe we can put some uh, links in the show notes to those two episodes for those who maybe want to dive a bit deeper down that particular rabbit hole. In terms, seeing as you've just mentioned, of the, the aero and how important that is, I've already sort of harped on a little bit about that in this episode, what was the development process of getting your car sort of aero worthy of, of time attack, if you like? Yeah. So one of the things that I did was just kind of look into research of aero and I didn't really know too much about the big elements. So, you know, I ended up just going with something very, very basic was just a flat splitter. There was no tunnels. I wasn't savvy enough to design some tunnels or put tunnels in, in the splitter. So version one of the car or two of the car uh, was just a uh, a cognition wing, which was like a nine inch cord with, and I think it was a 72 in length. So single element. And it was just a guess of how high to put it. I was like, this looks good. And so I, <laughs> I put it yeah. there uh, and yeah, it's a flat splitter and it worked. It had no flat bottom. I gutted the car. So it weighed like 2,650 pounds at the time. And that engine that I spoke about that I was like, what's the biggest NA engine we could build in the car? made 660 horsepower. So uh, it was a great time attack build for something that, for instance, would run laps. I think it'd run until you know we shut the session down. It was great. It was actually a, a very simple setup and a very effective platform because that was like my, my first year of, of running time attack. And it was still the factory transmissions, uh, six speed, you know, manual. And as I progressed, obviously things changed and I learned. And But that car was what I campaigned around for year one and I got I won super lap battle but then I lost when I would go to the midwest because I didn't know those tracks and so I was like my whole you guys are going to beat me and yeah so year one was a very big learning curve and you know, I knew that that was going to happen so I, but I learned a lot of tracks I learned a lot in it and I knew what the, the development was looking like and what was going to happen because I have a very addictive personality when it comes to stuff like this 
And so I knew I was in trouble and I started to look at what track records were at because at the time, you know, the unlimited cars were 10 seconds faster than what I was running. And everyone that ran in the class that I was running, which was one step under unlimited called track mod or limited, depending on who you ran with, was like, you can't touch those cars. And it's like, why? Challenge accepted. Yeah. Uh, they're like, you know, those Hondas, the Mitsubishis, the, the Subarus, they're just, they're untouchable. They put, the way that they're put together, he's like, they're, it's not going to happen. And so I took that as a, a challenge. And yeah. I was like, well, I, Hold I, my beer. I feel like a Corvette could give them a run for their money. And sure enough, here we are. A few years later, clearly you've proven you, you're absolutely right. Just coming back to that era in terms of like, let's sort of fast forward it to the development of what the aero package on the car current day is. How did you get it to that point? Who do you partner with? And what does the process look like of, of getting the right parts to suit your car? Yeah, so in the progression of the car, aero was an area that I was lacking. And that was the thing. I knew I couldn't run a, a plywood splitter forever. As affordable and, and well-rounded it is, eventually you need more grip. You need more downforce. And I started to venture off into different directions and different companies. And I did like, you know, would bolt on a package or something to see if that would work. You know, I knew if I really wanted to start getting more serious about it, I needed to get with the partner that knew aerodynamics. And one of my friends, Jackie Ding, he was working with Virus and I was looking at his cornering speeds and he was out cornering me and I'm in the class above him. And I was like, how is this guy? And I'm looking at the car and it doesn't look like any kind of crazy aero package on the car. Like, yeah, he has an aero package, but I was like, how is this thing, you know, out cornering me? And so I looked at the design of the splitter. And I'm like, okay, wow, that's, that is a lot different than my plywood splitter. So anyway, I talked, I ended up talking with Virus and we formed a partnership and I told them, you know, the, the things I wanted in, in the car, I wanted a very, very low drag setup. And so hence the wing came down. We were like, how can we get drag out of the car? And, you know, the wing was pretty high up there. And now the wing is almost in line with, with the roof line of the car, which we don't really see that very much in time attack, which makes me wonder. That's like a thing that I've always saw is like that high wing triple element sometime and, and the dual elements really up there. And my car is very, very low on the wing element, but also the front end of the car of, of the Corvette is very slippery. The body of the Corvette is very slippery to begin with. So um, I gave Virus a list of things that I wanted in an aero package and they came back with package number one and it's something that's very similar to what we see on the huna pig assist and i was like i can't build that <laughs> as, as amazing as that just to be clear here you weren't asking for a, a fully developed bolt-on package from various you were basically getting them to develop the shapes of the parts that you would need and your intention was to then build them yourself is that that's correct Correct. And Virus will offer the building of the parts themselves, but it's just outside of my budget. So basically you had to dumb it down a little bit into uh, something that wasn't quite as complex in the shape so you could actually manufacture it yourself. Yeah. When I, I see like triple elements in a front element, right? I know I already know I can't do that. I need something that's basic with tunnels. And so they, they came back with design number two, and that was what I have now on the car. And it's a multi-level splitter design very wing shaped with different tunnels and heights and you know it's to me it's still i don't really know what they all do still i kind of <laughs> have like a, a, a an idea it just works yeah but it but it works and it works so well that i have even till this day a very hard time keeping the car off the ground and i have done so much with spring rate i have tried raising the car and i hate raising the car because it gets it out of that aero bubble and so i don't know what to do and and this is an area that I struggle in is in the suspension side of it, because although I, I do all this myself, I am not a, a master in anything. I do well in everything, but there's there's so much that I, I lack as far as knowledge. I think particularly when it comes to setting up the platform and the suspension in a car with serious amounts of, of aerodynamic downforce, it straight away raises some really serious problems because Obviously, the faster you go, the more downforce the aero package makes. So the harder it's being forced into the ground. So the tendency then is to needing to run stiffer spring rates 
in order to keep the car off the ground, stop it from bottoming. But of course then that is detrimental to your mechanical grip under slower conditions where the aero is, is not so great. Then you get into that other scenario which you just mentioned about raising the car. I mean when you've got a properly developed underbody, within reason you, you want to run that incredibly low to the track to optimise its performance. I mean I've greatly simplified that but you know in, in rough terms. So everything is essentially about compromise. A lot of the people I have talked to where rules dictate you can't run a, a sort of a heave spring arrangement or something of that nature are uh, using bump rubbers and packers to essentially limit the compression travel of the suspension kind of in a, a crude way of keeping the car off the ground at the higher speeds. Is that something you, you're playing with as well? Yeah, so I end up running a bump spring now and I went the bump rubber route and it just didn't work out for me. No matter what I did, I could not keep the car off the ground and it was relatively quickly, like anything over 145 miles an hour, the car would just be bottoming out and jumping all over the place and destroying my splitter. It just was really, really bad. Now I have a, upwards of a 3,000 pound bump spring in the car on all four corners and it still gets into the ground and I packer it up. I have like a, right now, I think a little over a quarter inch of air gap between the bottom of the shock and the top of that bump spring. Yeah, we still can't keep the car off the ground. And I say we, I can't keep the car off the ground. So little information that I know, it's like, yeah, we want to keep the car, the vein spring as light as possible. So that way we still have the mechanical grip and, and the car transfers weight the way it wants to. But I've been having to just go up in rates, you know, and it's right now, man, my front mainsprings on the shocks are 2,000 pounds. So I have a 2,000 pound mainspring and a 3,000 pound bump spring on each corner. And so the idea of I want all this downforce is also, it's great if you can use it and you can keep the car off the ground. But it's also very difficult to set up and to, to, you know, drive with it. And so I always play with the ideas, you know, since I don't have a team, I don't have people and and engineers to help me and, you know, to tell me what we're going to do and, you know, change the suspension and stuff. I'm always in this guessing game of, okay, well, this is what's happening. Let's try to do this. Let's try to do that. I sometimes think that as much of a benefit downforce is, there might also be something as too much downforce. And at least for a team like myself, when I have too much downforce and I cannot control it, maybe I need to back it off a little bit and focus more on mechanical grip. So downforce is a blessing, but it can also be a curse. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I just wanted to take a moment out of our interview with Ferris and talk about a package that we've put together that's going to be perfect if you're enjoying this interview and you're also interested in getting your car out on a racetrack, and that is our Track Day Starter Package. This includes a range of our courses. It starts with our Race Driving Fundamentals course, which, as its name implies, will teach you the fundamentals of race driving. As I said in the introduction, getting the most out of your car on a racetrack is very very different to the skills that you've built up learning to drive on the road obeying normal road laws and some of these skills are not that obvious such as trail braking for example learning about the traction circle and how you can optimize the handling and balance of your car you also learn about line selection and how to optimize your line selection for a particular section of your racetrack you learn about aspects such as vision or where to look on the track again something that really isn't that obvious until you actually start digging into its importance We're also including our motorsport wheel alignment course. Now most people will take their car to a wheel alignment specialist when it comes to making alignment changes and that's great but what happens when you set your car up for a dry track, get to the racetrack and now it's raining. Well it's obviously not practical to take a wheel alignment machine to the the track with you. However with some relatively cheap and simple equipment, string wheel alignments can be done at the track quickly and easily. And if you're thinking to yourself, hold on a minute, string alignment, this sounds pretty backyardish. Well you might be surprised to know that this is the exact technique used by 
professional motorsport teams and if you've ever walked around the pits you'll see these cars on their setup patches with strings attached doing exactly this. In this course you'll learn about the different types of suspension, you'll learn how the suspension alignment will affect the handling balance, how to make these changes and we've even got a step by step process you can apply while making your own changes to ensure you don't overlook any critical steps and make sure that you get the right result. We're also including our practical corner weighting course. Now this is a little bit more advanced and it's absolutely not an essential element if you're at the grassroots or just the occasional casual track day level. But again if you've walked around the pits at a professional race meeting chances are you've seen cars up on corner weight scales and the process here is adjusting the weight balance of the car on each corner and this can have a big impact on the handling balance of the car and there's a lot that goes into understanding this. This course will teach you everything you need to know as well as again a step by step process that you can apply to corner weighting your own car. Then once you're actually out on the track data analysis is one of the keys to optimizing your performance and if you're thinking that data analysis packages are expensive well there are levels to this. One of our favorites is the AIM Solo 2 DL which is a relatively cost effective device and it's completely portable. You can just suction cup it to your windscreen and it will give you feedback on your data. It will also give you lap times via GPS and just with this very basic data set it's it's possible to then make dramatic improvements to your lap times, finding out where you're not optimizing the performance of the car. This course will teach you what the fundamentals of a data analysis package are, how to set this up for your car and then most importantly how to analyze the data. On top of this, this package will also give you two years of gold membership which gives you access to our private members only forum. This is the best place to get reliable answers to your specific track day questions and you'll also get access to our regular weekly members webinars which is where we cover off a particular lesson. It might be on race driving technique, it might be on data analysis or car setup, we could also be covering engine tuning, engine building, wiring or 3D modelling. You'll also get access to our back catalogue of existing webinars, you can watch these in our archive, we've got over 300 hours of existing content in here and this is an absolute goldmine of information. This package deal is usually 397 US dollars, you can use the coupon code FERAS100, that's F-E-R-A-S 100 and that'll get you $100 off. Now if you use that coupon code you are still protected by our 100% money back guarantee guarantee. So you've got a 60 day no questions asked money back guarantee if you purchase and for any reason at all decide it's not quite what you expected let us know you'll get a full refund of the purchase price. We also have a payment plan option to break that payment down and make it a little bit more affordable. You can find that at the checkout. Alright we'll put a link to that package as well as that coupon code in the show notes. Let's get back to our interview now. I mean one of the elements as well around downforce I'm just wondering if the sort of setup changes you make depending on the track obviously downforce is, is not a free lunch you're going to end up with drag as a result so I mean a lot of it you, you mentioned earlier is focusing on getting a high downforce package without any excess additional drag so basically minimizing the drag at least as far as possible which obviously makes sense. In terms of your setup do you change your downforce or aero package more specifically to suit maybe a long very high speed track versus something that's maybe a little bit tighter with less high speed areas? As much as I should I don't. I end up the package that I have is kind of just like the only package that I have. I, mean, I, have, <laughs> yeah. I, have, <laughs> I have like other splitters and wings that I've ran throughout the years but I kind of think that if I'm trying to develop something I need to focus on on that one thing and I'm trying to develop this the chassis for this aero package and the more I deviate off the aero package that's on the car currently the less progress I have towards dialing the car in so pretty much I run the same aero package everywhere I go I see the penalties, see it all the time in, in a straight line for sure because anytime I ever run or anytime I ever look at data versus the car currently versus the car last year the year before with a lighter aero package on it in a straight line I'm getting murdered by myself you know I was beating myself to the braking zone every single time and you know although I might be cornering quicker 
again to the next braking zone. I'm beating myself. So I'm finding time. I'm improving the car. You know, a set aero package for each track that you go to would be a, a huge benefit. I mean, obviously, also a lot more work involved in doing so. I can only imagine, though, you've got at least some adjustability in that, even if it might just be maybe rear wing angle. Is that the case? And if so, is it something you do tend to adjust per track or as the track evolves? Or is it sort of, I left it at that angle for the last 12 events and, uh, yeah, that's probably good enough? It's pretty much the good enough route. <laughs> I know it's not what, what you want to hear. No, well, I mean, this, this is reality though as well. And I've, I've often, I'm a bit of a tech nerd and we obviously do what we do at HPA for a living. So I, I love data. I love anything with some level of adjustment. And then the reality is that you get yourself into the situation often where there is so much adjustability in the car. It's very easy to A, do nothing or B, make changes in the wrong areas and actually make the car worse. So sometimes I I genuinely think, particularly if you're not a professional racing driver, if you don't have a team of engineers helping you develop the car, sad to say, often less is more when it comes to things that you can tinker with and and adjust and um, actually, you know, just go out there and and drive the car and drive, learn to optimise your driving for the package that you've got as it sits. Is that kind of your approach as well? I always tell people when they're like, oh, yeah, the track feels like this. Or like, what are you doing? Are you changing ring angle? Like, are you changing springs? What like?" And I was like, honestly, I'm changing myself because I think the car is great. I think it's, I can improve. I can always improve myself way more than I can improve the car. And 90% of the time, I think that, you know, it's something that I can improve as a driver quicker than I could in the car. And I'll be chasing my tail trying to figure out something if I make these adjustments on the car. So as far as rebound settings, compression settings on the car, I never touch them. As far as wing angle of the car, I never touch it. I get it to where I like it. The car is very predictable and I'm very comfortable in driving the car. So the wing angle that I have on the car, it's probably been on set at that angle for the past, yeah, maybe 12 (laughs) events. Um, It it has not been touched. And stock settings themselves, since they got back from Penske the last time they sent them to me, you know, I might have tweak them a little bit to get them where I want them I haven't touched them since if it's not broken don't fix it it kind of reminds me of our last season of endurance racing in, in our 8.6 which I mean obviously nowhere near as developed as yours but we do have a fairly substantial adjustable single element rear wing on it and when that all went on we kind of got it set up in a ballpark that seemed to work pretty good and I was kind of resistant after that to actually make any changes and uh, it was the last event back at our home track and we actually went through an iteration of adding rear wing angle and I think we we did it in three sort of sessions and each time the car just, just went quicker and, and I'm talking substantial. I think aided by the fact that due to the bodywork we are very much traction limited in the rear, we really need a wider tyre than we can fit. So you know, getting that, that additional downforce really helped but I sort of came away from that event thinking well shit maybe we should have done that maybe like last year or the year before (laughs) you know and I sort of thinking all of this time that I was kind of giving away but everything's obviously easy with the benefit of hindsight. Let's move on to the rest of the car development obviously the the aero is important but uh, the more aero you've got the more drag you've got as we mentioned and the more power you need to keep propelling the thing in a straight line power levels and time attack have also kind of spiralled out of control so give us a rundown on the package you mentioned a a big nasty NA engine to start with you're you're absolutely not that anymore so what was that development? So honestly the push towards uh, twin turbo setup was winning super lap battle I had the NA setup in the car for years up until I, I went that route I always knew I wanted to make more power and that I attempted to go the super route or supercharged version at first and I never actually went through with it. But the mindset of behind it all was like instant power, right? We're not relying on the turbos to spool and more of an NA easy transition. Uh, On that note, I mean, when when you say superchargers, it sort of rolls off the tongue pretty easy. But of course, there are superchargers and then there are superchargers. What were you sort of aiming towards there? Was this a centrifugal belt driven supercharger or a twin screw style blower? Yeah, it was belt driven. My idea behind belt driven was that it wouldn't be creating as much heat. You could reject the heat because it was separate from the engine itself. But if you have a, a twin scroll screw uh, blower on top of the engine you're constantly just you can't get away from it it's just heat soaking and so that's kind of why i started to go that route and then the idea 
of running it quickly escaped when I started to see people constantly tossing belts. And I'm like, well, it would be really horrible if I'm on my lap and a belt decides to exit. And so I was like, okay, well, that can't work. And I can, I can see other routes to go. And I started looking at OEM manufacturers and what they were doing. And they have such intricate designs of the, uh, the serpentine belt driven blowers. And it's all to keep that belt on. There's so many pulleys and there's so many tensioners on there. And I'm like, well, how can I develop something like that? How can I make something like that? And everything I saw that was, you know, a, a Corvette kit was very, very, it was lacking a lot of tension. You'd see this, these very long runs of belts without tensioners on them. I think the problem is a lot of these packages are designed for streetcars. And what will work on a streetcar, which let's be honest, the majority of, of even heavily modified streetcars probably get a handful of pulls for you know, maybe through the gears for five or ten seconds and, and then the rest of it, you know, a thousand miles of, of driving basically sedately at, at the speed limit very different to taking a car out and punishing it lap after lap around a racetrack so of course you take that street car developed package put it on a racetrack and unsurprisingly the wheels kind of fall off yeah and what i would find was it was all the the off throttle right on throttle the belt is on it's being held on the second you snap off that throttle which we do every single braking zone the belt wants to jump off and that was something where i was like okay well if i have 20 turns that's 20 chances that that belt's going to fly off the car. Uh, and so that was like, okay, well, we're not going that route anymore. We're going to f- try to find a way to go turbo. So the, the idea of going turbo was there for a while. And I actually had an engine already built because I knew I was going to eventually go that, that direction. So I already had an engine built just sitting there ready to go turbo. And yeah, ended up winning a turbo from Super Lap Battle uh, in 20. 20 i believe it was right before covid i ended up talking to garrett to claim that turbo and i told him my plans with the car and what we were going to be doing and the idea of traveling around and trying to get track records across the u.s and they're like well we want to be on board let's send you another turbo so perfect so that became my way into the turbo realm and the way of going through a lot of engines as well and spending a lot of money because although all the power sounds great there's also the diminishing return of you know lifespan and expectancy of, of engines. I think that's a part that is really easy to overlook, but unfortunately, it's the reality of it. Uh, just before we move on from the supercharger versus turbo, centrifugal superchargers, I haven't, I don't actually think I've owned a vehicle with one, but I've tuned plenty of them. And every time I sort of compare a centrifugal supercharger, I'm probably going to get a lot of people offside with me here who, who love centrifugal superchargers, but when I compare that to a turbocharger, yes, the turbocharger comes with a bunch more complexity, although it doesn't come with a belt that can jump off, but the boost curve between the two is what always sort of drives me back towards the turbo and the flexibility of being able to control that boost. Now, yes, there is going to be a lag factor with the turbocharger, I think, you know, within reason, if the turbocharger is well-sized and you're using a relatively narrow rev range, which typically you are if everything's working how it should in a a race application, the lag is really less of an issue. But in comparison to the centrifugal supercharger boost curve, which essentially just continues to climb as the RPM increases because the supercharger is being driven by the engine speed, do you see any sort of what's your take i guess on the boost curves of centrifugal versus turbo and pros and cons for time attack application yeah so at the time i was comparing it to what the na engine was doing and it was very similar to what na engine does that's making a lot of torque right off idle pretty much my engine was a 468 so it was it was like a 7.7 liter and so i would have all the torque immediately and so i was very comfortable driving like that because I drove that that car for years. So I said, okay, well, if I'm just looking at comparing graphs and I'm saying what's making the most power under the curve, it's the supercharger. And now that that might be unusable power, but in in the mindset of me just looking at a graph and I see a lag for for turbo and instant power for supercharger, and then I put my NA graph over that, the supercharger trends towards a big NA torquey engine. And I was able to manage that power. It was a lot of throttle uh, modulation. At the time, I had no traction control. I mean, even version one and two of my build 
turbo had no trash control. So it, it was still modulating the, the power regardless. I, I think now what I know, the turbos are the better route as far as managing traction. Even now, like, you know, I don't overpower my NA engine until, you know, one or 2000 RPMs later, but I'm still breaking traction out of a corner when I'm making less. So it's interesting to see like your mind's like, oh yes, that's more, I want that. But all that's unusable. Uh, it's gonna make your life hell to get out of a corner. And you're probably gonna hate yourself later when you toss the belts and you can't even finish the lap. One of the things that I like about the power or torque delivery of turbocharged engines is the flexibility and, and how much torque you're going to be producing and there's a lot of tricks that we can do electronically now through wastegate control where you know you can control the boost relative to throttle position to get a more linear relationship between the driver's pedal position and the amount of torque the engine's making, making the engine easier to drive on the limit. You can also use gear dependent or gear and speed dependent boost control, so pull the power and torque down at lower speeds where you are more traction limited. So it takes a bit to set that up and optimise it approximately for the track, but you're prepared to put the time in. I think it makes for a much easier to drive package all round. Which I guess brings me to the next element of the build. Can you run us through the electronics package, what you're running there? Yeah, so the package itself, so I'm running an M150 from Motec. The package itself is a G-Speed LS7 package, and this originally is like their plug-and-play kit. It comes with a jump harness so that you could still run all your factory electronics. Um, and at the time, that's what worked for me because you know it was very early on in, in my build. And so the actual package is, is very, very basic. It's the GPR pretty much set up, but it's a, it's an LS7 package in the car, and it was uh, it's their firmware for G-Speed. So there's actually very, as much as you have ability and adjustability in MoTeC, the package I actually have is very limited. Okay. <laughs> well, I'm glad I talked about all those things that you can do anyway. <laughs> We can still do a lot of the things you, you talked about. Yeah. Okay. So, I mean, ultimately, everyone listening is now wanting to know, you know how much power does it make? What sort of boost are you you're using to make that power? Yeah, what are the stats? Yeah. So, typically, with just on the spring, which is eight and a half, nine pounds, the car is making 850 horsepower. And I'll use that pretty much to do sight laps, you know, learn the track, stuff like that. I'll, I'll be using that low setting for a while when I'm in Sydney. The high setting that I have in the car to date is 1300 horsepower making that's going to be making at 18 pounds of boost. And the reason as much as like the engine build itself is a 2000 horsepower build, right? The, the actual long block can make support 2000 horsepower, but I thought that would be not very smart to push a car, the engine at that high of a level in the short period of time that I have to go to Sydney and hurt the engine before it gets there and have very little time to rebuild it. And, you know, it's just like as much as I want to make 1500, 1700 horsepower because the car can, is it worth it? You know, I already know I'm going to go to Sydney and I'm going to go to have fun. I'm going to go to have a good time. It's something that I've wanted to do for a very long time and I idolize World Time Attack and going there. And I'm, I'm still kind of shocked and blown away that I'm going to Sydney. Like it really, although my car is halfway there right now, it's still, I don't think it's a hundred percent sunk in, but I know I'm not going to be the most competitive person. You know, I have personal goals of mine that I want to achieve and it's very, I don't really know how to explain it, but it's like, anytime I go to an event here in the U S I have one goal and that's to, to set the record, right? Um, I'm going with a different goal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that might, uh, how would you put it, come across maybe as a somewhat arrogant goal going to World Time Attack for the first time. Not that you're obviously not an incredibly capable driver in an incredibly capable car, but I'd, I'd wager just having gone to World Time Attack for the last eight years that maybe just the level of competition at that event might be just a touch higher than maybe some of the events you're attending in the States. Uh, and I'd be happy to be proven wrong there as well. Oh, no, no, no. It's, you're not going to be proven wrong. The competition level is is way higher. I think the thing is, is uh, we don't have builds like that here in the US. You know, my build might be to some be a crazy build. It's relatively simple. It's, it's a Corvette with tw two turbos on it and an aero package. Some of the builds that we're you see in Sydney are, are insane. My build times 10. It's, it's got teams and uh, developers in it and engineers. And, and we don't see that in the States. We don't have that here. 
we're so behind, I think, in time attack in the US that although my car might be one of the fastest here, it will probably be a mid-pack car in Sydney. Yeah, I know. I think though the level of competition has really driven the development at World Time Attack. It's one event where uh, Ian's bringing cars from all around the world, like yourself, of course. There's always competitors coming over from Japan, and because you've got that sort of competition, it's driving each of the teams in the top level to sort of every year iterate and throw more money at the car and more parts at the car to find that in the next couple of tenths of a second. So you know, definitely without that level of competition, I don't think you'd individually see any of those cars going as fast as they are now. But I mean, obviously from a spectator standpoint, man, even from a competitor standpoint, it, it's got to be an amazing experience, I think. Coming back one step, I'll talk a little bit more about Time Attack in a moment, but just coming back one step to that electronics package. We mentioned boost per gear or or boost versus speed. Are you using any of that? You mentioned sort of 850 horse at low boost and uh, then 1300 odd at at your high boost. Is that simply like a, a dial that you've got control over and that's it, you leave the pits in your first gear or your top gear and, and that's what you've got or does it does it automatically vary versus the gear or speed? No, I'm not using any kind of crazy uh, strategies. Um, it's literally just 100% in every gear. There's no throttle position gearing or boost by throttle. It's all there. And I really like it like that. If you give it to me, I have the ability to use it. If I don't have it, then I could be full throttle exiting a corner on you know on 60% throttle in second gear or something. But maybe the car could have put down 80% or something. I like knowing what it can and can't do, and I just will try to modulate it myself. I mean, I think a, a lot of that also comes down to that style of power delivery where, at least in the lower gears, you're almost certainly going to be able to overcome the available traction. There's a lot more requirement from the driver with that sort of a car versus what I was talking about earlier where we've electronic, electronically kind of dulled it down or matched the torque to the available traction so the car is less likely to snap sideways uh, and, and surprise the driver. So yeah, would you say that what you've got there does require a little bit more involvement from you? A little bit more involvement from me. I do rely heavily on Motex traction control. You know, that that's a good indication to me. When I start hearing that going off, I know, okay, well, that's what it can take. That's holding that limit there. And so I will rely on that. But electronics are amazing. You know, without it, when I ran the car without it, it you know, was seconds slower. It was something where it's like, okay, well, now I have to take control. I have to modulate this. When Motec comes in like that, you can keep your foot down. You can hold that power level and it's going to hold it there until it has more traction. So it's it's pretty, it's a, two different driving styles. Also, if you're you're leaning on that that TC, let's just say mid corner, and it's a high speed corner, if you try to counter when TC's involving or intermittently, like cutting uh, ignition timing, if you counter that, you're going that direction. You have all the, you have all the aero forces. You know you have all the downforce trying to keep you to the ground. You have TC cutting the power, and you feeling slip. And everything you have is to start countering. Like every intuition you have is is to oh i got a counter and i've done this so many times where you know i'm starting to the rear end stepping out and i turn into it and now i'm like going that way on the track so it's a case of learning to trust the process trust the traction control you have to trust the tc and i've been in situations where that car is just holding slip angle for me i'm still holding the wheel turning the way i want to go and i'm fighting everything in me to, to counter it and it is a crazy feeling but uh, it just brings me back to how amazing electronics are. Yeah, definitely. There's a lot of ECUs now that, that offer traction control, and I think it's kind of like one of those things where you're looking at a spec list on an ECU, it, it's an easy box to tick. And the reality, which I, I think I've probably talked about in the past, though, is there's traction control, and, and then there's actual traction control. And some forms of traction control, a really good example, this is an aftermarket, but uh, the factory uh, Toyota 86 traction control, absolute garbage. Like, yes, it will stop wheel spin, but someone might as well turn the damn ignition off. Like, the car absolutely dies. So, you know, if you want to go fast in a factory 86, you are absolutely disabling that traction control for the moment you leave pit lane. And the same sort of goes, I think, for the aftermarket EC world. You've got traction control systems which will stop wheel spin, but you're going to be slow. 
And then the systems that are really highly developed and when you've got them tuned correctly, as you say, you can kind of hold slip angle there, you know, keep your foot pinned to the floor and, and the ECU is kind of picking up the pieces and you're fast. I know from my own experience with Motec, there is quite a bit of sort of setup that goes into that and there's a lot of control parameters. I don't think you've actually tuned this yourself, so I don't want to get too deep into stuff maybe a little outside your own knowledge level, but was there much involved in getting that dialed in or was it kind of a hit the track for the first time and i look at that it just works so when g speed first got into that package for me they already had tc set up so i don't know what they did on their end now motorsports electronics aids me in tuning the car he's gone through the tc settings and i'm not sure if he's changed things or not in it that is a whole section of tuning that i know nothing about but with my levels, I just have a knob that I can dial in more, dial in less, or dial out. But funny enough, I don't really tend to, to turn that knob. I could have almost picked that. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's kind of just one just of like the real wing. Forget it. Yeah, yeah. it's just okay. there. So <laughs> Good to know. All right, uh, coming back to the world time attack element. So you've got... A long way to go to get there, the car's halfway there already, obviously it's a, a pretty big event with a, a lot of press coverage so I'm guessing rightly or wrongly you might be feeling a, a bit of pressure to perform even if you're, you're not maybe aiming for the lap record this time around. How do you go about getting yourself prepared in terms of learning a track that's on the other side of the world? Are, are you using a, a simulator or anything? The pressure for one is going to be great. But I feel like that comes at pretty much any high level event that you go to in which like the second you get behind the wheel, it all just kind of seems to go away. You might have all the pressure up until that point, at least for me, the second I get behind the wheel, it kind of just, I'm in a different element. I'm in a different zone, but prepping for the, for this, I've been prepping for over a year now. I knew I was going to be doing this. And so I've been you know running the sim and I've run it. I don't even know how many hundreds of hours I have now in some time or on that track. But uh, the biggest thing for everyone, I think, is turn one. And it's very, uh, it's, it's, it's frightening that there's not a car in the sim that will allow me to do what I think the car will do in real life. In other words, you, you can't go flat through turn one at 270 odd kilometers an hour on the sim? Well, so I'm running a set of Corsa and I only have like a handful of cars to choose from. And those handful of cars that I can choose from cannot do it. Some of them will do it with like a flick of the car and, and you know, a lift for a second or two and then get back on it. But when I watch the RP968 go through turn one, I'm like, man, there is no car in the sim that can do that. There's a lot of times in, in the sim versus real life, there is a lot more grip in real life. I've noticed that in iRacing that when I go to Road Atlanta or Road America, wherever it may be, I physically know what I can do in that corner. And sometimes the sim just says, nope, we're not doing that. And even if I'm driving a, a you know, IndyCar, for instance, or something, I know the IndyCar will have the grip capable of taking that corner at, at the speed that I'm trying to take it. And it just kicks it out. So I'm hoping that is the case with turn one around Sydney. But I've also gotten like some messages from other competitors saying like, hey, just so you know, turn one flat out is not a thing here. <laughs> <laughs> just, we're just giving you a heads up. Yeah. So I mean, I definitely wouldn't recommend it maybe on your uh, your outlet, but no, no, no. I, I think a lot has been made about the, the cars that do go flat through turn one. And, and I don't know for sure. I can imagine it's probably um, far from the entire top class of, of the field anyway. You've obviously just always got to feel these things out and kind of build up and learn where the grip is and where it isn't rather than sort of overstepping early on in the in the piece. I, I guess on that basis, you know, how much weight do you put, and not just Eastern Creek, but I, I'm guessing you're using your sim rig for the other tracks around the US that you regularly frequent. You know, how, how much weight do you put on the benefit of, of using a sim uh, versus actually being on the real track using the sim is great because you get familiarized with the track and like i stated earlier what makes a great driver is being comfortable and i find that although the times are different the performance level of the vehicles are different just knowing and familiarizing myself with my surroundings knowing somewhat breaking points somewhat you know speeds for corners that is huge for me and I think Road Atlanta, before I went there, I did maybe 200 hours of sim time. 
And I went there and session one was immediately at the pace I wanted to be at. I told myself, you know, lap one, first session, I want to be at a low 20, 21, 20 if possible. And first lap on track, I was 21. And that was like with a broken power steering line, like doing all sorts of bad stuff. <laughs> so it was like, okay, wow, there's a lot of pace here. But I gave myself a goal I, and I was very comfortable. I was overly comfortable and I still I didn't drive the car the way I should have. I didn't really give it full 10 tenths, but going to Sydney with the amount of time I've had on the sim, I'm going to be very comfortable at least around that track at seven tenths. You know, when you get to nine, 10 tenths anywhere, I think it's, it's very hard to be comfortable in a, a high, strong, high horsepower car. Yeah. I, mean, I think for me, the, the benefit of the sim is, is learning a new track, not necessarily the last sort of tenth or two tenths or whatever that might be, but you know, understanding the flow of the track, understanding the lines. Uh, if you are in a situation where you can drive a car with, a, you know, a model, I should say, with the same gearing, etc., as your own car, it gives you an understanding of you know, what gear you're going to be in for what corners. And when you're dealing with these super accurate laser scan tracks as well, with really good graphics, you know, you can start picking up like what you might be using as a, a braking mark or a reference. You know, so again, maybe it's not going to be perfect, but you're not going to waste a session or two just getting yourself up to speed. And of course, you know, in your situation, you're traveling to the other side of the world for a two-day event. You're not going to get a huge amount of track time. So that track time that you, you get, you, you really want to make it count, correct? Oh, yeah. No, I mean, the sighting of the track, if you get there with no, let's just say you didn't do any sim time at all. I mean, day one is going to be learning the track. And you might finish the event with not ever really being comfortable because time attack cars, are only going to be ran for so many minutes before you have to turn them off, before you have to cool them down. So let's just say you ran the car two laps per session. You had a total of six sessions. Like, wow, you would never figure that track out. You you never you never were comfortable. So as, if you can get more comfortable behind the wheel of a sim, that is you know equates to how many visits of the track. Like you know, I, I would say me going to Sydney with the amount of symptom I have now. It would have been as if I've been to Sydney, I'd say like two or three times, right? That's what I would think I get out of it. And I think if I'm returning to a track, I'm more comfortable than first time visit. Okay. Yeah, perfect. That, that makes sense. All right. I think we'll, we'll move on towards wrapping this chat up, Ferris. I, I do want to respect your time. And we've got the same three questions we ask all of our guests. And the first of those I'm going to throw at you now. What's next in the future for you? I don't know. That is <laughs> okay. such a great question. It's such a great question, but there's so much that is out there right now that I have the capability or that have been presented to me that I would absolutely love to do. It's just if it's going to be feasible or not. What's next for me is going to be Sydney. After Sydney, I really don't know what's going to happen. It's going to be good. I know that. And I hope I hope it actually does happen. But I do have that second build that I'm building right now. Yeah, so you're building a whole, whole new car, right? Yeah, I'm planning on having that built in the next three months. And then I plan on competing with that here in the U.S. So hopefully I can get that done in the timeline that I'm aiming at and continue to compete with a car because this trip with my main car leaving is going to be gone for a very long time. And no car for a driver equals no fun. <laughs> yeah. So. Just without going too deep on it, the new build is essentially uh, an identical Corvette. Are you doing anything dramatically different or is it just uh, basically a rinse and repeat of, of what you've already done? It's going to be a, a better build because the car currently was gone through stages. It was always you know, transitioning and, and changing into something else. And there has, there's so many holes in random locations for different, you know, arrow or whatever I might have used at the time, mounts. So A, I know what I'm going to be doing because I've already done it now and it's going to be a replica of that car. So I'm not going to have that evolving stage that I had with that car. I already have all the parts picked out and arrow wise, everything like that. So yeah, it's going to be just a better car because it's going to be purpose built from day one to being a, a clone of what my car is now. Yeah, okay. No, that makes perfect sense. All right, our next question. Is there any advice you'd give to a younger version of yourself to help reach where you are today in your career faster? Maybe avoid any pitfalls that you might have come across? Uh, yeah, I would have told myself, get in a go-kart. 
<laughs> I think getting in a cart as early as possible would have been so big because the development of a driver that I maybe could have been, you know, would have been there, hopefully. Besides that, there are so many times that I just like, I'm sitting there staring at my car, ask myself, why? You know, why am I doing this? Why do I continue to do this to myself? Why don't I have a team of people helping me out? And it would be, you know, never quit. Don't stop because you never know what's going to happen. And if I were to quit, if I were to stop doing this, when the going got tough a long time ago, when the first, second, third engine blew up, when, whatever it may have been, all those frustrations, I wouldn't be able to go to, to Sydney and experience this amazing you know, experience I'm about to have. So Yeah. I mean, I, I think it's fair to say that uh, nothing that's uh, easy is worth doing. Usually, you know, these things that we do, they are hard and there are always bumps along the, the way. And that's kind of part of the learning curve. And I mean, I think at the time, maybe they suck a little bit because, you know, you got to knuckle down and fix whatever you just broke. And, you know, it costs money. It takes time. Maybe it's a late night. But, you know, going through those battles, that's what makes you tougher and that's what kind of gets the results that that you're getting. So, you know, if it it was all plain sailing, I think probably wouldn't be as fast as you are and probably wouldn't have enjoyed the ride along the way as much as you have at a guess. Is that that fair? Yeah, maybe a little (laughs) bit. You know, there there could be a lot less late nights, that's for sure. (laughs) I feel uh, I'm at the garage Man, so pretty much midnight, almost every night, working on this thing. So if I could cut that time in half, that'd be great. But hey, like you said, nothing, uh, nothing comes good. That's easy. So, and I think that every time we're prepping for a race event, and fortunately, I'm not doing as many as you. But every time we're sort of loading up, and it's ten thirty, eleven thirty at night, and I'm sort of thinking to myself, you know. No matter how well we plan, no matter what, there always this always seems to be the the, the point we get to is yep we're going to be loading the car onto the trailer at eleven thirty at night the the night before we're about to leave for the event and I don't know I, I can't fix that it's been that the whole way had that with drag racing as well it just seems to be motorsport for me but I mean I guess it would also help if we didn't want to tinker with the car modify things and just left things as they were it'd be a lot less to do but yeah you know, where's the fun in that as well man this uh. This last go around for me at Super Lap Battle, and I think it was in March, I had that mindset of I'm finishing the car early, I'm testing early, I'm going to be ahead of the game, I'm not going to be the last minute guy again. And sure, what did you know it? In testing, <laughs> something goes wrong. Yep, back to square one. The day before the event, I'm pulling heads off the car and machining heads and putting the literally rebuilding heads, putting it back on the car as I should have been unloading at the track. So it's it's always something. Yeah. You know? Maybe maybe some of our listeners can uh, afford us some tips on on how to avoid those because I haven't figured it out <laughs> in twenty odd years in the in the industry. All right, Ferris. Uh, last question for the day: If people want to follow you and see what you're up to, how they best to do so? Best, I think, is Instagram at Ferris underscore Cartoomy. That's pretty much where I do everything. Uh, I try to do Instagram or YouTube stuff, but it's so much. YouTube is so hard, and I applaud anybody who does YouTube so well, like yourself, it is so time consuming. There is so much involved. Uh, It is a lot. And I've been tinkering with it a little bit. And man, it is so difficult. You spend so much time trying to create something, you create it, and then nobody watches it. And you're like, why did I waste so much time? Yeah. I mean, unfortunately, that algorithm really rewards consistency as well. But I mean, uh, when my kids were younger, uh, I used to get really frustrated. We'd, we'd spend a, a hell of a lot of time traveling to the other side of the world to shoot a, a video, which I thought was great. And we'd put it up and, I don't know, maybe to get 50,000 views. And uh, then my daughter would be watching a, a toy unboxing video that, that's <laughs> got 13 million views or something stupid. And you're like, what are we doing <laughs> wrong? This, is just, oh. this isn't working. But um, no. yeah, yeah. we're obviously in a different niche. No, I applaud anyone that does YouTube well because it is it is so difficult. But if you wanted to find me on YouTube, it's the same thing. Ferris Cartoomy on YouTube. There's nothing special there. But well, we'll chuck uh, we'll chuck those accounts in the show notes to make it super easy for people to find. Uh, great to to chat with you, Ferris. And we'll also put a link as well. We shot an interview with Ferris at uh, SEMA last year. So for those who are hungry for for a little bit more content, we'll link to that. And um, you know. 
I look forward to catching up in person at World Time Attack and seeing whether you can stick it to the top boys at World Time Attack. No, we're not going to do that. We're just going to have fun, man. But. Yeah, it's always got to be fun. But uh, yeah, thanks for the chat and uh, we, we will catch up over there. Awesome. Thanks for having me. If you enjoyed this episode of Tuned In with Ferris, we'd love it if you could drop a review on your chosen podcasting platform. These reviews really help us to grow our audience and that in turn helps us to continue to get more high quality guests. To say thanks, each week we'll be picking a random reviewer and sending them out an HPA t-shirt free of charge anywhere in the world. This is also a great place to ask any questions you might have and I'll do my best to answer them if your review gets picked. So this week, a big shout out to NS Racing from Australia, who has said, best four wheel pod of all time. Andre and the team, thank you so much for your efforts, awesome content that always hits the nail on the head. Well, thanks for the kind words there, and if you get in touch with your t-shirt size and shipping details, we'll get a fresh tea shipped straight out to you. All right, that concludes our interview, and before we sign off, I just wanted to mention for anyone who's been perhaps hiding under a rock and hasn't heard of High Performance Academy before, we are an online training school, and we specialize in teaching a range of performance automotive topics, everything from engine tuning and engine building through to wiring, car suspension and wheel alignment, uh, data analysis, and race driver education. Now remember, you've got that coupon code. You can use podcast75 at the checkout to get 75 dollars off the purchase of your first course you'll find our full course list at hpacademy.com forward slash courses important to mention that when you purchase a course from us that course is yours for life as well it never expires you can rewatch the course as many times as you like whenever you like the purchase of a course will also give you three months of access to our gold membership that gives you access to our private members only forum which is the perfect place to get answers to your specific questions. You'll also get access to our regular weekly members webinars, which is where we touch on a particular topic in the performance automotive realm. We dive into that topic for about an hour. If you can watch live, you can ask questions and get answers in real time. If the time zones don't work for you, that's fine too. You're going to get access as a gold member to our previous webinar archive. We've got close to 300 hours of existing content in that archive. It is an absolute gold mine. So remember that coupon code PODCAST75. Check out our course list at hpacademy.com forward slash courses.